So hello, welcome uh, to today's CSDMS webinar. Uh, I'm your host, Mark. I'm a research software engineer at CSDMS. The title of today's webinar is a little different than what Steve put on here, but that's okay. We were talking about that. So the title of the webinar is the USGS National Hydrologic Model, Continental Scale Modeling for Decision-Making, Research, and Education. The webinar will be presented by Steve Markstrom and Rich McDonald. Steve has been a hydrologist with the U.S. Geological Survey in Lakewood, Colorado for over 25 years. His specialty is in the development and application of hydrologic computer codes for surface and groundwater modeling studies. He's currently working on approaches that allow these models to be run in near real time. Rich is also a hydrologist, modeler, and application developer with the U.S. Geological Survey, also in Lakewood. Uh, his interests include applications of surface water, riverine flow, and sediment transport, eco-hydrology, and new coupled applications using the CSDMS modeling framework. <clears throat> so after the presentation, we'll open the floor for discussion. Uh, everyone can unmute their mics and ask questions. Uh, also, feel free during the presentation to use the chat window to ask questions, and I'll try to collect those and feed them to Steve and Rich at the end as well. So a side note, uh, I've actually been working with Rich and Steve for over a year on a project that got initial funding from the USGS. It was on the recommendation of the USGS Community for Data Integration, and some of our results will be presented today. Um, and on a personal note, that collaboration has been awesome. I really enjoyed working with you. <laughs> so thanks guys for coming today. All right, so with that, I am delighted to present uh, Steve Markstrom and Rich McDonald. So take it away, guys. Thanks, Mark, for that great um, introduction. Um, I'll just say that Rich and I, uh, Rich McDonald and I, are, we're gonna do a tag team here. So I'm gonna start off and kind of give a little bit of context for what you're gonna see later, which is really a live demonstration of what our collaboration with the CSDMS team has been all about. So just be a little patient. It may not sound like what you thought you were signing up for, but bear with me and we'll, we'll definitely get there. So. As you can see from our, uh, the title of this part of the talk about the national, something we're calling the National Hydrologic Model. Go ahead to the next slide, Rich. So uh, as a little bit of background, the USGS has more or less um, offices like in every state. That's not exactly true, but that's the way to think about it. And um, people... Uh, scientists in our offices are experts in their part of the country. And what happened was all of these uh, watersheds that you see here were models were set up in those areas by the local USGS experts. And then um, we as kind of, you know, uh, national, you know, the national developers of the model, we decided what we wanted to do was uh, basically run the uh, CMIP um, climate change, the weather sets, you know, 100 year weather sets through the models, that, the watershed models that we already had set up. And we thought that would be a great idea. And it worked. And we had a, uh, uh, a study. It was, you know, more than 10 years ago, but we set up a study of this. You can see all the different areas and the watersheds we set up. Go ahead, click Rich. And here you see kind of the idea of what we're doing. Uh, go ahead, click again. There was a problem with this, however, is that all of these models were set up in different ways, right? Uh, they were parameterized differently. They were using different data sets, um, different uh, configurations of the model and different calibration studies were, were used when setting these up because they weren't set up with the idea that we were going to do an integrated study with them. And part of, you know, I would say our study was 50% evaluating the CMIP uh, climate change scenarios and 50% evaluating the modelers who set up these models, right? So I'm going to click on the next slide. 
So the idea was maybe for these kind of, this kind of study in the future, we would set up a national um, hydrologic model, basically treat the whole lower 48 as a giant watershed, okay? And model it all in the same way. So these three circles over here, physical models, geospatial fabric input data, those are kind of the components that we worked on to make this up. Go ahead, click Rich. All right, so the first thing I'll talk about is the geospatial fabric, basically how we define space for this national model. Click again. Okay, so some of you may know what the NHD plus catchments are. We defined um, the left and right banks uh, contributing areas like the watershed contributing areas to each of each stream segment as our um, definition of space. And that's kind of what you see here. There's more than, way more than 100,000 HRUs uh, or spaces in our, essentially, like I said, our watershed model of the lower 48. Go ahead, click Rich. And what we did was we only took, okay, so somehow we have to characterize these these spaces or these HRUs to get them to work in our model. So we only took like land cover and vegetation and, you know, DEMs that had the full extent of CONUS. And then we characterized our model with these CONUS wide data sets. Next slide. We do have the ability to um, run the model with evolving landscapes to match the evolving climate or weather data. This is an example, but this makes it a lot more complex, but that is possible. Next slide. Okay, go ahead and click. The next thing I'm gonna talk about are the actual models that we're running here. Um, the daily models, go ahead and click, Rich. Okay, so underlying the the NHM or what we're talking about here, the actual simulation model, something called the precipitation runoff modeling system. And you see a little schematic there of how PRMS views the hydrologic cycle, basically the driving, the drivers, the weather drivers, precipitation, uh, temperature, solar radiation, those things kind of come in at the top. You see a layer called plant canopy, moves down towards the land surface, um, most of the characterization that was done with those, um, you know, the land surface and vegetation coverages exist at, at that uh, layer between the atmosphere and the soil zone. Uh, but the, the point here is to really get this box over on the right is to generate stream flow. That's kind of our, our final output variable in the chain and that's kind of what everybody's looking at but all these other states are simulated as well next slide please rich all right another aspect oh, another, oh you're okay okay another aspect of this we want to show a little animation here if you look at the box the, the conceptual diagram on the left basically this part it's implemented as a module in pms um, is simulating both uh, the water budget and the heat budget on 150,000 or more, more than 150,000 stream segments on a daily time step. And that's the animation that you're seeing on, uh, on the right. And you see it varies by region, by sea, you know, the stream temperature varies by season, by region. By, you see storms moving across the landscape. That's a lot of the flashing. So um, to kind of parallel along with mean daily stream flow, we're simulating mean daily temperature. And the, this operational model we talked about does that as well. Okay, next slide, please. Another Okay, this is kind of unrelated to what we've seen before, but another kind of important part of this is like, if you're running a model for the entire CONUS, that's a pretty big model and it takes a long time to run. And a lot of, and not very many people are actually interested in running all of CONUS at the same time. What they're interested in is the area 
you know, where they're the expert or, the, or where they're being paid to do a modeling study. So we've implemented some software. It's, it's called Bandit. And this box over here on the left, what you see are all the HRUs of CONUS, but clipped down, right? This is the CONUS map, but clipped down. And then in here, you see an, a smaller watershed that might correspond to like one of the watersheds that we were looking at on my, um, you know, second slide, like water, uh, watershed modeling studies, right? This could be an area that you want to do a watershed modeling study. So we have software that you identify the area that you want to model. And in this case, it's identified by a stream gauge, a location of a stream gauge at the outlet and the HRUs and the stream segments and all of the input and all the output is subsetted from the big model, from the CONUS model. And the idea here is that this small model runs exactly the same way. These HRUs run exactly the same way as they do when they're running inside the big model. But it's not the big model, right? It's a small, it's a small model that people can use for their individual study. And here you can see somebody's refined some smaller HRUs inside of it. Anyway, I think if you're gonna do this modeling at this kind of scale, you have to provide something like this kind of pullout. Next slide, please. Okay, and we're, I've used the word operational national hydrologic model in this talk. And the question is, so what does that mean when I say operational? So one thing is this particular version of the model has to run on desktops, on laptops, on Macs, on Linux, on Windows. We have a Cray um, high performance system, the USGS, and this same model has to run exactly the same way on all these platforms. So what we've done is implemented it in Docker. Uh, and, if, and if you have a machine that runs with, that'll run Docker, you can go to Docker Hub and download exactly what I'm talking about here and get it to run on your machine too. Click please, Rich. Okay, another thing that makes this operational is we have deployed this chain or pipeline of Docker containers on the Amazon cloud. And it runs every night on the Amazon cloud. And that is a big part of what makes this operational is that this model runs automatically every night. Um, next one, Rich. We are using the so-called S3 or simple storage service. When our model runs in the cloud, it dumps all of its files, maybe not all the files, but a significant set of the files to S3. So um, we as humans, I guess, can pick up the output. That's another important thing is to be able to get what the, the uh, cloud is doing. Click again, Rich. And the final thing is that, and I kind of alluded to this, we connect that version of the model to make it operational connects to a web data service called GridMet. And it's a, it's a relatively high resolution um, weather server that provides temperature, precipitation, humidity, relative humidity, solar radiation, all that kind of stuff in a near real time setting and the data is available on a daily basis from basically 1979 through yesterday. So we've set it up so our model is driven with this weather, uh, near real time weather service, okay? That, these four things are what we call operational. Next slide, please. And I'm, I'm done basically and Rich is gonna show a this, this is actual output from our CONUS National Hydrologic Model. This is like a two year run, daily time steps. You see some of the uh, drivers uh, animated in the upper left or that uh, most left-hand column and then different storages that the model is simulating. You see those running at different speeds and then fluxes, examples of fluxes in the third column from the left and then finally, Stream flow and stream temperature are shown in the lower right-hand corner as this model is running, again, on a daily time step through time. And that's the end of 
the back the background of what you're going to see Rich um, talking about next, which is really our collaboration with CSDMS. Thanks, Steve. Yep. <clears throat> so uh, before we get into that, I also want to mention that that version of the NHM that Steve was just talking about is available on our GitHub site. And you can go and download that and run it on your own machine. So it's really, it's a set of containers that go out and test to see that the GridMet data service has been updated today for yesterday's climate. And then it does a 60 day pull of that climate data because that climate data is considered provisional over the last previous 60 days. And then it runs PRMS with um, some pre and post processing of the data formatting around the PRMS run. And then finally reruns PRMS to increment the hot start file by one day and extract the results. And you can set that up in a cron job yourself and have it run every day and generate output at a CONUS level. And that output that Steve was talking about is used currently for a conceptual map of water availability that's served every day um, from the model output. Okay, so we're gonna talk about our, our um, collaboration with the CSDMS community to, to test uh, the capabilities of uh, the BMI and PyMT um, as a tool for um, coupling uh, USGS models together or USGS models to other models, basically to test that coupling capability. Um, integrated modeling is an important component of the US Geological Survey's science strategy. And it's also been identified as a priority challenge for the USGS by the National Academies of Sciences. And one of the outcomes of the integrated modeling prediction um, division of the USGS five-year plan was to de develop and deliver a modeling and prediction collaborative environment or a sandbox that can be used to couple hydrology and other environmental simulation models with data and analysis. And that's the context in which we um, began our collaboration with CSDMS to, uh, to look at a sort of proof of concept of, of wrapping some code in, in a BMI and testing the coupling capabilities. And more recently, the USGS is initiating uh, an initiative called EarthMap where EarthMap kind of lies in the common, uh, common area of data and in information integration, integrated pre predictive science and actionable intelligence. Um, and this idea of a sandbox from a computational modeling perspective, I think lies within that same shared common space. So I'm sure a lot of people uh, here today are familiar with this CSDMS model framework or the BMI and PyM and PyMT, but I'm just gonna review it a little bit from my own perspective. Um, so component models encapsulate a set of related functions uh, into a reusable form. And if you look at almost all model coupling frameworks, they all initiate from this idea of component models. And in object-oriented programming, a class bundles data and provides methods that operate on the data within a single unit or component. So you can think of your model, and in this case, PRMS, we're gonna turn it into a component, a modeling component. And components communicate with each other via an interface. And that's where CSDMS BMI comes in, the basic model interface. It provides a uniform software interface that allows model components to communicate with each other. And sort of the basic functions of that software interface are things like initialize, run for time step, finalize. Um, if you're a modeler, you know those are just sort of your common basic run functions. And then there are a set of uniform setter and getter functions that allow you to set or retrieve information from that model component and pass it to another model component. And then there's some time functions and there's much more to it, but that's, that's the basic gist. And what's really cool about what CSDMS has done is 
is you can have a model that's written in a variety of languages, C, C++, Fortran, or Python. And if you apply the BMI or you componentize those models and apply the BMI to it, they have a really nice way of then wrapping that code in Python and providing a bunch of tools that allow you to uh, facilitate coupling of one model to another. But think about it, you're, you're, no matter what the underlying programming language is of your model, you can then start coupling those models together in a common language, which is Python. And, and then using all the available uh, packages that Python brings for data wrangling and, and, all, and presentation uh, to that model coupled, uh, coupled model. And that's kind of what we think a sandbox would do. And just as a small aside, the other thing is, uh, I think uh, data or data streams or data services can also be wrapped in a BMI and applied within that model coupling framework. So we're, we're gonna also talk about a data service component. So our experimentation result revolved around PRMS. And what we did is we broke PRMS into four principal components, uh, a surface, based on, on sort of the four principal reservoirs in PRMS, the surface zone, soil zone, uh, and groundwater zone, and stream flow zone. So we decoupled the main PRMS code into these four uh, components, and we created a BMI and uh, a model component for each of those. And, and as I was alluding to, we also did that for the GridMet data service. So I'm gonna go through a quick demonstration and I'm not gonna go in depth into the code itself, but I think it's just, just look at the model runtime interaction uh, from a, a sandbox perspective, um, pay attention to using data services. Uh, I'll just reiterate that PRMS is a, its underlying code base is Fortran and we're running it in Python and that maybe that's more common these days, but it's still really cool. And I think you'll see, you know, if you're a modeler and you're not used to this kind of thing, it's super fun. And all the code that I'm gonna be showing today is available in this GitHub repo. Uh, and you can run it yourself on CSDMS's Jupyter Hub, which is what I'm gonna do right now. Okay, so now I'm in the CSDMS Jupyter Hub and uh, we're looking at the repo here. And I just wanna note that I'm not gonna go through it, but, but there's two notebooks in here. The first notebook is actually, it's just a simple validation notebook. So what it shows is PRMS BMIs recoupled back together to form a single model and it's run and compared the output of that coupled model is compared to the straight output from PRMS. Um, and there are no differences in the output. They're absolutely the same, which of course we'd all expect, but it's still like just to do that and know, yeah, the output's still the same after breaking PRMS, wrapping it and putting it back together, it, it all works, it's great. Uh, what I'm gonna show you is sort of a, a demonstration of, of what PRMS can do with the uh, BMI. So we're gonna look at a small watershed in North Dakota. Um, this is, uh, this example I'm showing here is an example of an extraction from the Kona scale model uh, with Bandit. The watershed we're looking at has 14 hydrologic response units or HRUs and seven stream segments following the main creek here of pipe stem, uh, following the main drainage pipe stem creek in this watershed. Um, this is part of the prairie pothole region in North Dakota. So here we go. So we're just gonna initiate the model and you can see from PyMT, we're importing our surface, soil, groundwater, and stream flow component, BMI component. I've got just some bookkeeping stuff to do here. I'm gonna import some shape files that we can use to plot the results of the model output. 
and I'm going to just set the path to the run directory and the PRMS input files for each of these components. And I'm going to initialize the model. Remember, initialize is one of the BMI components. This is just simply we're reading in the, the model input file and configuring the model, getting it ready to run. And then <clears throat> I've got uh, one other function here that's just simply reading those shape files into two pandas, GeoPandas data frames, a, a data frame for the HRU data and a data frame for the stream segments. And also just to do some plotting of climate, I'm just importing the climate file that's used by PRMS for this model run. And here we're just plotting Tmax and Tmin and Precip um, on the spatial footprint of that watershed. To sort of demonstrate, you know, to have something to look at, uh, what I did was I plotted the cumulative precipitation over time, starting from a year at 365 days uh, through 485 days. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show the output. We're going to run the model and look at the output around this precipitation event here at, at approximately one year and 90 days. And then we'll look at the output. And we're going to then we're going to do two more things. We're instead of using the sort of pre-formatted model input data, uh, input that's, that is read from pre-formatted files, we're going to use our GridMet data service to drive the model. And then we're going to just do an impulse uh, function on the, on the watershed. We're going to drive one HRU with a bunch of precipitation and look at the response. Here's just some other basic uh, functionality of the BMI. We're just looking, we're, we're grabbing the PRMS's now time, and we're also just looking at the model start time, end time, and current time. These, these are BMI functions. Okay, so here's the coupling, and I'm not, I'm not gonna go into great detail about this, but essentially what I'm doing is I'm just setting up um, some arrays of the, of the exchange variables between each of these four uh, BMI components. So example, surface to soil VARs. These are the variables that need to get transferred from the surface zone to the soil zone or surface to groundwater VARs. And what I did is I just created a, uh, a set of functions to do those exchanges between the four individual BMI components. Um, and again, here you can see an example of the BMI uh, functions where from soil, I'm setting the value from surface of those VARs. So it's just, here's the set value and get value. So I'm exchanging information from the surface um, BMI to the soil BMI. And I simply wrap those all up into one update coupled function that we'll use uh, in the model as we step through in time. So I'm going to run the model for one year plus 90 days to get up to that time step uh, where we noticed there was a big precipitation event and we can look at the model output from that event. I'm also, I'm going to just, while that's running, I'm going to step through a couple of these other functions because they take a little time to run. And, uh, and I can talk about some of the output in a, in a minute here as those, uh, as the model finishes running and we start plotting some output data. So you can see, I'm just stepping through in time and updating the coupled model for 455 days. And then I'm gonna run that model for an additional seven days. And I've just, I've created just some helper functions here to plot the output as a function of time. And that's what we have here. So. Uh, from top to bottom, we're just increasing by a day and time. And from left to right, we're just looking at some principal output uh, from PRMS itself. So we've got the Tmax temperature, the precipitation, the total soil moisture uh, within each of the HRUs, the surface runoff, 
um, and subsurface uh, from the soil zone and groundwater zone contributions to the stream channel, the stream channel through that watershed. So, it, you know, uh, you can see as we get a large precipitation event here, um, soil moisture increases and you can see some surface runoff, uh, not too much subsurface flow or groundwater reservoir flow to the stream segment, but you can also see that ultimately that flow gets to the stream segment and, and moves as a slug uh, downstream with time. So then I also, I just ran it for an additional 19 days, which gets us to another precipitation event. But this time I'm gonna run it with this GridMet data service. We haven't completely wrapped this in a BMI yet, but that's something we're working on. We're almost finished with it, but this function does essentially the same thing. Right now it's, it's going out and it's fetching GridMet data from the GridMet thread server and formatting that data so that we can use it to drive precipitation and uh, the min and max temperature of the model in real time. This should take just another minute or so. Sorry about the pause here. Yeah, so now it's it's actually running through its loop and and we're assigning temperature and precipitation pulled from GridMet thread server to the model at runtime. So here we're just showing that same set of model output, but this time rather than driven from, from model formatted input files, it's just driven at runtime by going out to a data service, grabbing the data um, and then map. You know, and, and uh, I think one, one thing is that uh, PRMS is, has this unique fabric defined by you know, uh, shapes derived from the shape of the watershed. Uh, the grid met data is actually gridded data. So the other thing that that function does is it maps it from gridded data uh, using a, a weighted area function to each of the HRUs. And you know, maybe in this case, it's not the most efficient use of it, but one of the other things that we're interested in doing is driving this model with seasonal to sub-seasonal forecasted data. And in that case, it really makes sense because at every day you're essentially going out and getting, uh, getting new model data to drive the model. And in that kind of application, this, I think this data service idea makes a lot of sense. Okay, then and for our last sort of uh, forcing here, rather than um, forcing it with the data, we're just gonna override everything and, and we're just gonna apply uh, a precipitation event of three inches per day to a, a single watershed and then look at the response uh, from that impulse to the system. It's something you might want to do when you're setting up a new model and you're trying to understand how the model responds to specific events. Often times what you like to do is run the model and kick it in the butt some way and, and see how it responds. So that's what we're doing here. So now we've applied a large precipitation event to just a single HRU and we can look at the response of that in time. And you can see the soil moisture goes up, uh, the surface runoff goes up, but only last for a day. And both the subsurface reservoir and the groundwater reservoir continue to, uh, um, continue to uh, lend uh, flow to the stream segment itself. And you can see that the stream segment gets a big pulse of flow and that pulse starts uh, migrating downstream through the segment. So another way you can look at that is simply by taking the output from PRMS itself as net CDF files, and then plot the data as a function of time for, for, for one or more of the HRU. So that's, that's what we're doing here. We're just simply looking at uh, the, 
the value of those variables as a function of time for a single HRE within that event. And then um, finish PRMS up by finalizing. And that just closes everything out and, um, and then we're done. So that's, that's the end of my demonstration. Steve, I'm gonna pass it back to you. Okay, so I would have to, or asked, I would, uh, my job now is to put a little summary on all of this. And um, after seeing this particular demo, I mean, I think it kind of itself, but as a, um, as an old time, you know, old time uh, hydrologist and hydrologic modeler, I mean, to see like how all of these technologies kind of come together and really fundamentally change the way um, that we would, then, then this kind of hydrologic modeling could go forward, right? Like using the Jupyter notebook to record the workflow and integrating the graphics right in with the model and stepping forward being able to step forward in time and see the response in space and time of what the model's doing for some selection of variables. You know, as Rich showed this to me, and instead of having like a spinning hourglass, right, you have the output of the model plotting up on the screen for a bunch of different variables, right? Just using this kind of, like all the, and of course the BMIs to be able to, um, uh, give this kind of access to the individual parts of the model. This is something as, you know, I'm not a, not really a computer scientist, I'm not a computer scientist at all, actually, but seeing this application within this context of technology, um, you know, I wouldn't have thought anything like this would be possible, you know, a couple of years ago five years ago, 10 years ago, I wouldn't have thought anything like this would have been possible at all. I think this really has the potential to change the way hydrologic modeling is done, Physi you know, run physically based models. And finally, to kind of take it back to the context of phys you know, physical modeling and what we do at the USGS, you know, we're trying to solve real world problems, right? We're, we're applying these models and doing modeling studies with them. And you, if you think about how different components from different types of models, say, you know, um, other, phys other physically based models, groundwater models, water quality models, you know, whatever. These kinds of models could be coupled together the way Rich showed to solve much broader kinds of problems than what we're solving right now with um, kind of how the models are broken down. And I hope, I hope everybody saw that, or at least if you're interested in this kind of stuff, I hope you got that from this demo because yeah, I mean, we want to show BMI's working and we're working tightly with CSDMS people, but you know, why are we doing this? And the real reason is because we have an interest in broadening our modeling capability to solve a broader set of real world problems. And I think this is a, this is a real approach to doing that, you know? I mean, this is like the first step, but this demo that Rich showed, in my mind, really shows a lot, really, really shows a lot. And I mean, I'm, I'm not just trying to toot our own horn here, but this demo is using all these technologies kind of coming together. And maybe that's what we'll leave with and turn it, I guess, turn it back over to Mark and um, Rich and I are happy to answer any questions um, that people may have about what they saw today. Awesome, thank you very much, Steve. Thank you, Steve and Rich. And everyone, let's thank our presenters. I'm gonna use my little reaction. So thank you guys for a great presentation. And Rich, that demo is so smooth. All right, so everyone, if you'd like, please uh, feel free to unmute your mics. If you'd like, ask questions. Um, 
I'd like to give a couple moments just for people to, I'll be quiet for a moment or two to let people ask questions. How about that? Mark, I just want to say I couldn't have done it without you. Oh, dude. <laughs> Thank you very much, Rich. <laughs> I know, awkward silences. So if you'd like also, feel free to uh, ask questions in the chat. Uh, actually, I think there are a couple. Uh, I have one, I think uh, for Rich, uh, from Mary Hill. Uh, she okay. asks about, in your, in your demo, uh, the large array of maps with the stream flow time series on the right. Uh, what's the time series? What's the time of the maps? Yeah, it's a, it's a daily time step. So each each row represents a day, day and time. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Okay. I. Uh... If I'm not mistaken, Rich, the, the actual timestamps are specified, like just at the top of the. Uh... Yeah. I mean, we're seeing the time step, the timestamps there. So those timestamps up there correspond with each row of the, uh, the visualization. Yeah, and that, that came from a misunderstanding on my part that Greg corrected, that I, that, um, which is, uh, I thought uh, the figure on the right looked like a hydrograph to me. Oh, yeah. I was thinking at the time, and then I was starting to think, well, how do you know where on time you are? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, yeah, that's... That's just the spatial footprint of the stream segment in this yeah. small watershed. Yeah. Is it the same scale as what's on the left? It looks like it's a little bigger. So uh, that's what... Good question, Mary. I'm not sure. It doesn't look like it's the same scale. It looks like the plot has fit the stream segment itself rather than the, the watershed. Yeah. 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 So I just got confused. Yeah. <laughs> So this is awesome. I love this. this is, you've done so much with this. I'm just thrilled. Thank you, Mary. Got another question from the chat. This is from Rajbir. Oh. Uh, he says, great work. Uh, questions, is NHM competing? Is it a competing model with NOAA's national water model or is it complementary in some way? Um, no, okay. This is definitely, I would, this, this is definitely uh, complimentary. I think the, um, the focus and the out, the, the focus and the purpose of the output is, um, is different, right? So for, for NOAA, uh, what NOAA is trying to do is really, I think, when they talk about operational, what they're talking about is uh, running operational weather forecasts through their operational model to really um, do, um, you know, I'll call it short-term flood forecasting, whether you think like a week out or three days out is short-term or not. But their model runs on an hourly time step. The weather forecasts are coming in an hourly time step. And they're really much more, I think, probably focused like on rainfall intensity and what that does to uh, create uh, flooding situations. Um, our model definitely has a USGS uh, flavor to it. You know, you think of the historical context of stream flow or stream flow gauges, you know, they go back, some of our stream gauges go back 10 years, 50 years, more than a hundred years. Okay, and we like to run our models over those kinds of, over that kind of period to, uh, it, I think it's more of a trying to understand the processes, the, the hydrological processes that are at work and translating those weather into uh, you know, different components of flow and, you know, uh, that, that we're seeing here. So, I, so in a lot of ways, the models are doing the same thing, right? They're taking weather and making stream flow. In a lot of ways, it's a completely different kind of focus. So I would say they're uh, very much complementary. 
We've got a question from Chang Liao. Chang, if you want to unmute your mic to ask, you can. Hello. Hey. Okay. Hi. Uh, first, I want to uh, thank you for the very ac excellent talk presentations. So I'm from Pacific Northwestern National Laboratory. Over the years, I have used uh, PMS, Model Flow, and GS Flow. I probably have sent emails to some of you earlier. Yeah. So uh, yeah, thank you for all of the support and excellent work. And uh, just just uh, follow up some comments you have earlier. So a lot of times that uh, we are dealing with uh, uh, like uh, extreme event like uh, floods on a national scale. I mean, for example, when you have some some extreme event, you have to consider the whole large overall basins, watershed like Mississippi or Columbia. So large scale and some of the question cannot be answered without uh, with, with just with a simple small watershed models. I think that's well, the national hydro, hydrological model stand out to answer some large scale challenges. For example, the flooding maybe in California, some or in the Middle West. So I, I'm, one of my questions is uh, how, how far are we from provide, it, last year I think there was a, there was a flood in uh, Michigan as well. Some small town was flooded. So how far are we trying to apply this uh, novel, this high high tech national hydrological model to to forecast for put us in a better position, prepare for this type of uh, extreme events? Yeah. Okay, that's a that's a really good question. And and anytime you're doing modeling on such a large scale, you know, uh, and by large scale I mean you know, lower 48 states. That's a large scale model as far as we're concerned. I mean, I know people run on the globe and, you know, so it's always going to be relative. And I think the, the question, you, you really have to think about the questions that you're trying to answer as far as um, if the model is appropriate or not. I think that uh, related to the last question, we're not running on a sub daily time step. We're not running on a sub hourly time step with this particular model. So if you're looking at, you know, like thunderstorm type floods, this is probably not the system that you wanna be looking at. If you're looking at, um, okay, the snowpack, you know, in the Rocky Mountains or the snowpack in the, uh, Sierra Nevada is starting to melt and the temp, you know, there's a big snowpack and the temperature went way up and or the, te you know, the daily temperature has gone way up and, and you're worried about, you know, like two weeks of high flows. Um, you know, that, that's another type of flood, right? Like our, like how much storage do we have in reservoirs? How much, you know, those kinds of seasonal type floods, have we saved enough uh, flood storage in our reservoirs? You know, those kinds of questions. Um, this model is probably more um, uh, uh, tailored to those kinds of questions. So, uh, you know, depending on what you call a flood and depending on like how fast the system is going to respond in that particular kind of flooding, you know, you may want to use this type of modeling or you may want to use something that has a much finer time step like the national uh, water model or the, you know, the wharf hydro version that the weather service is running. So um, there, there's a lot of different questions that get answered. And I think that you really want to use a, ta a system or a model that's tailored to the, the specific questions that you're asking. And that, I think that's why there's so many different models is because, uh, you know, hydrology models is because people are asking different questions. And that's, you know, and this, we have, we're trying to fulfill a niche with what we're showing here and other people, you know, other agencies certainly have other responsibilities and other you know, grad students are interested in different kinds of scales and responses. So, 
I would answer your question that way. It may not be a real satisfying answer, but I think, you know, decide where your application fits and then get a model to fit that, I think is, would be my answer. Yeah, thank you for that explanation. Yeah, yeah. I think that's less uh, for different type of uh, scenarios, especially when we are talking about scales, both in the spatial scale, but also in temporal scale and some of the process. So for example, the one you mentioned, like a question of uh, forecasting like wolf hydro. So those may be a you know, better position like a, to, to, to focus on some intense within 24 hours, those kind of sure. events may be a better position, but for some some dec decadal or some uh, annual seasonality, maybe maybe this national hydro model might may have better because we have balance about the performance and also the the yeah, computational cost as well. That's Thank right. Thank you very much. Yeah. The, this model, you know, not to, this model that you're seeing here runs very very quickly, much much more quickly than. Um, say the national hydrologic model. So we're able to generate ensembles, you know, like run it for a hundred years out, run it for a hundred years back. Um, this model is very, runs very quickly and doesn't have, you know, the cost of that is we don't have all the detail. Uh, detail in space, detail in time, detail in hydrologic process. Um, this model does not have all those details, but it runs much, much faster. So that's another trade-off. Yeah. We have a few more questions from the chat. I can address a couple of them quickly. Uh, so this uh, presentation and the question and answer period afterward are being recorded. And we will send out an email when the recording is available. Also, it'll be available on the CSDMS website. Um, the uh, notebooks that Rich used in his demo are all publicly available. I'll copy the uh, URL into the chat and so you can see that. Um, uh, one more I can handle quickly is, uh, uh, let's see, uh, BMI. So uh, this is a question from Caitlin. Uh, BMI, if BMI is any support for paralyzed codes, that's a good question. So the current answer is no, although we actually are looking at that. Maybe I can, that's, I, I can say that. It's very possible and we're looking at that. All right, uh, there are a few more other questions that I, I uh, would like to pass to Rich and Steve. Um, one is uh, for vegetation cover and land use, is it changing with time for a larger time horizon and for the steps in the model? I don't know if I quite transcribed that correctly there, but I guess is the vegetation cover changing with time as well in the model? Oh, um, in the, okay. In the version of the operational model, the answer is no. We're not using dynamic land cover because what we're trying to use is, uh, there's this kind of combination we have to do of like the latest stable land cover kind of crossed with our best model calibration, right? So um, we, have to, we have to recalibrate our model to the vegetation we're using. And in that, in the operational sense, what we're trying to do is the most important run of the model is the run that ran last night with the weather that ran last night. So we're trying to use the most current land cover we can with the most current model calibration we can to generate yesterday's hydrologic response, okay? In terms of the national operational model, that's what we're doing. Now, as I said, we have made model runs uh, with evolving um, land cover. And basically in that case, what we do is we derive a set of input files that each correspond to um, updated versions of the vegetation. And then we uh, run the model and step forward until we hit that new land cover and then run the model until we hit that one. Uh, but so we can run that way, but what we're showing right now is not being run that way. So hopefully that answers your question. Right. 
another question and we'll do just a couple more. I wanna to try to keep us before 11 so we can keep it to an hour. Uh, one question from Huri, uh, do you plan to add mod flow to this framework as well as water management? Rich, why don't you take that one? Yeah, so uh, the mod flow group has been working with Del Taris and they have a, a, a version of BMI wrapped around mod flow. Uh, I think that should be available very soon. Um, yeah, so it's there and, and, and there are other hydraulic models, Deltaris, their Delft 3D FM model also has a BMI. Those may not be available right now to run within PyMT, but they are able to run uh, in Python together. And, and there's lots of potential there for coupling. All right, maybe time for one more question here. So um, this is from Sarah. How or at what level of detail are stream channel characteristics like slope and hydraulic geometry represented in the model? Uh, she's thinking about using applicate or thinking about applications for sediment transport. Okay, that, okay. And, and that gets back to kind of this uh, scale and resolution issue that we've talked about before. So the, the, the model that we're showing right here is doing um, hydrologic mount, uh, hydro, hydrologic routing. It's not doing hydraulic routing. So we are running at time steps that do not necessarily support, um, you know, momentum components. And again, you know, the difference between hydraulic and hydrologic is we're looking at mean daily stream flow. Um, some of the properties like that are based on velocity, we're not able to do. We don't uh, really have cross sections. Well, we don't have cross sections. We're not running on a sub daily time step. So things, so if you think, think about like, um, Muskingum routing and um, uh, you know Manning's equation, like characterizing uh, stream channels with roughness, using slope, using length, using uh, like the mean daily uh, storage type routing. Um, that's kind of maybe the level that we're at right now, and and again maybe that distinguishes. What we're doing here from you know the water model which i'm not exactly sure what kind of routing they're doing in the water model but it may be more hydraulic and of course of course if you're doing sediment transport maybe i don't know if rich wants to jump in here but you really need cross sections um i mean you don't but like the pros that do uh, the pros that do hydraulic routing are going to tell you any cross sections, and I'm you know, I mean there are things you can estimate, but it is really more of a uh, hydrologic type routing within this configuration that we're showing today, and that that's why it runs fast, right? That's why we can make hundred year runs in you know a few hours or an hour or something because we're not doing that kind of level. Okay. I don't know if you want to say anything, Reg. No, I think you said it. I, I you know, the, uh, the one way it might potentially be used is if the system you're looking at is suitable to model on a mean daily time step or mean daily flow. Um, one thing that PRMS can do to add to a hydraulic model is to provide ungauged tributary fluxes. 